In this video tutorial, we're going to be discussing the ideal vapour compression cycle and more specifically, we're going to be seeing how it can be applied to heat pumps and in this example, we're going to be applying this to a ground source heat pump. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of information on the screen. First of all, at the top, we have a number of diagrams. We have a schematic diagram of our vapour compression cycle, as well as PV and TS diagrams. PV stands for pressure and volume, TS stands for temperature and entropy. So as we go through the first section of this video, we're going to discuss the cycle and we're going to talk about how we can identify different locations throughout the cycle. So if we refer to our schematic diagram first of all, we can see that the entry to our compressor is labelled as number one, the exit of the compressor is labelled as number two. The refrigerant exiting our compressor then enters the condenser. So we enter the condenser at position 2 and we exit at position 3. After the condenser we have the expansion valve. Number 3 is at the entrance of the expansion valve and number 4 is at the exit. And number 4 is also the entrance to our evaporator. Number 1 being the exit to our evaporator as that completes our full cycle. Compressor, condenser, expansion valve, evaporator. Now in previous videos we've talked about what happens in each of those components in terms of energy inputting and exiting the system. So what we're going to do in this specific example is we're going to apply the schematic diagram as well as the PV and TS diagrams to an example. So directly underneath our diagrams we have a written example and we're going to do a couple of things here. As we go through the written example we're going to identify different points on our cycle and we're also going to extract useful information. That information can then be used later in the video in order to determine various different parameters for this heat pump. So the first paragraph then tells us that a ground source heat pump operates according to the ideal vapour compression cycle and we have our diagrams at the top there to represent that cycle. The refrigerant used within the ground source heat pump is R410A, details of which can be found in the thermodynamics property document for Freon R410A. And if you don't have that document to hand, you can Google Freon R410A Thermodynamic Properties document. We're going to be using that document throughout this video in order to determine enthalpies at different locations throughout our cycle. So moving on to the second paragraph then, it tells us that the refrigerant is compressed through an isentropic or constant entropy process and exits the compressor as superheated vapour at a pressure of 2800 kilopascals and a temperature of 65 degrees C. We also see in brackets there that the pressure and temperature stated there are at state 2 or position 2. Now there's a couple of key pieces of information there. The first key piece of information is that the compression is isentropic. Well we know that our compression takes place going from position 1 to position 2. The fact that it's isentropic, referring to our temperature entropy diagram, is that we have a fixed value of entropy here, and we notice that the entropy at both position 1 and position 2 are the same. And we're going to use that information later on to find out some additional information about state 1. The other information it gives us in that paragraph relates to the exit of the compressor or position 2. It tells us first of all that we have superheated vapour, it tells us that the pressure at position 2, which I'm going to call P2 in the top left hand corner, is 2800 kilopascals. And it tells us the temperature at that position, T2, is 65 degrees C. So already we have some useful information there so that we can determine things such as the entropy and enthalpy at position 2. Moving on to the next paragraph then, it tells us that the refrigerant from the compressor passes through a condensing heat exchanger and heat energy is transferred from the refrigerant into the room. Now recall that the purpose of our heat engine is to take heat from that refrigerant and transfer it to the room in order to heat that space. So if the air in the room is gaining energy or gaining enthalpy, then the refrigerant must be losing energy. It is worth noting that at position 2, we have our very high temperature refrigerant and in fact that's the hottest point for the refrigerant in this cycle. 
So moving from two to three, we have the refrigerant cooling down, but the air inside the room is going to be heating up, which is the desired effect. So it goes on to say that in doing so, the refrigerant cools at constant pressure until it reaches the dry saturation point at 2,800 kilopascals and continues to lose heat energy as it changes state back to wet saturated vapour also at 2,800 kilopascals. Now once again there's a few key pieces of information there. We know that at position 2 we have a pressure of 2,800 kilopascals. But if we refer to our PV diagram we can see that the pressure at position 2 and position 3 is actually the same. Therefore its pressure remains constant. As we refer to our temperature entropy diagram then, we can see that the pressure throughout this period here, between 2 and 3, remains constant. So the pressure at this point here is 2800 kilopascals, and the pressure here is also at 2800 kilopascals. Now that's some useful information about position 3, so we'll make a note, P3 equals 2800 kilopascals. The other thing we note from both our temperature entropy diagram and our pressure volume diagram is that at position 3 we're sitting here on our wet saturated vapour curve. We're in that exact same position on both of our diagrams. We'll talk more specifically about that later on but the fact that we're at the wet saturated vapour point there enables us to determine additional information about position 3. And in fact, I'm going to make a note now that H3 equals HF. The reason it equals HF is because the F signifies that we have wet saturated fluid or wet saturated vapour. And that's HF at 2800 kilopascals. We'll determine our value for H3 later on, but that's an important piece of information that we've managed to extract from the question and from our diagrams. So moving on then, next the refrigerant enters the expansion valve. So we see from our schematic that position 3 is the entrance to our expansion valve, where it is expanded through a constant enthalpy throttling process, becoming a cold, low pressure, wet vapour prior to entering the evaporator. So there we're defining state 4. Well, the fact that we have a constant enthalpy process means that H4, the enthalpy at position 4, must equal H3. Therefore, if we can determine H3, we can determine H4. The other thing that it tells us here is that we have wet vapour. And I want to draw a comparison here, because in the previous paragraph, we were told that we have a change of state back to wet saturated vapour. The reason position 3 is wet saturated vapour is because we're sitting on the wet saturated vapour curve there. The reason position 4 is just wet vapour is because here you recall we're somewhere between wet saturated vapour and dry saturated vapour, meaning we have a combination of liquid and gaseous vapour at position 4. That's something that can be defined by something called a dryness fraction for the vapour, where the dryness fraction is 0 on the left hand side, it's zero because it's not dry, it's wet saturated. And one on the right hand side where it's dry saturated vapour. So position four would have a dryness fraction. Now this is where the significance of the dry saturated vapour comes in. Because if we move to the next paragraph, it says the wet vapour entering the evaporator, we know that that's from position four, is heated at constant pressure and temperature until it becomes dry saturated vapour at state 1. So first of all, we know that we have a constant pressure process because referring to our pressure volume diagram, we can take an index mark on the pressure axis and we can see that positions 4 and positions 1 both sit at the same pressure. We also know that we have constant temperature by referring to our temperature entropy diagram because if we pick a temperature on our y-axis, we can see that position 4 and position 1 both sit on the same horizontal line. It goes on to tell us until it becomes a dry saturated vapour at state 1. So if we have constant pressure as we go through the evaporator, 
we know that P4 must equal P1. And if we have constant temperature, we know that T4 must equal T1. All we're doing here is listing all of the information that we know so that we can start to build up a bigger picture about what's happening in this cycle. Now note that we don't yet know what the pressure is at position four or position one. So I'm going to put equals question mark. But what we do know is that the enthalpy at position one equals the dry saturated vapor enthalpy at that pressure. I'll just put at question mark KPA because we don't know that pressure as yet. What we do know is that we have dry saturated vapor because this time we're sitting on the dry saturated vapor line on the right hand side of our curve. Okay, so what's the question actually asking us to do? Well, part A down at the bottom here asks us to determine the temperature and enthalpy of each state. So we're trying to find all of our T values, T1 to 4. We already have some of that information. And we're trying to find the enthalpy values, H1 to 4. Part B then tells us that the mass flow rate of our refrigerant is 0.04 kilograms per second. Let's just make a note right at the top. M dot equals 0.04 kilograms per second. We're asked to calculate the rate of heat transfer from the ground. Well, the rate of heat transfer from the ground is the rate of heat transfer into the refrigerant. We're asked to calculate the rate of heat transfer to the room. Well, the rate of heat transfer to the room is the rate of heat transfer out of the refrigerant. Remember that our calculations here relate to the refrigerant, not to the air in the room. We're asked to calculate the work done by the compressor. Well, the compressor is doing work on the refrigerant. And then finally, we're asked to find the coefficient of performance. C, O, P. So there's a lot of information contained within that descriptive question. And by using our PV and TS diagrams, we're also able to extract additional information which isn't necessarily given within the question. Now I'm going to remove the descriptive question because we've extracted all of our relevant data, but I'm going to keep all of our diagrams at the top there as we may wish to reference them as we go through this question.